My name is Kendra Lin, and I'm a new research geologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. My research focuses on using the chemistry of rocks and minerals to better understand how, when, and why Hawaiian volcanoes erupt. For Volcano Awareness Month, I wanted to talk about my favorite mineral, olivine. It's actually uh, very common in Hawaiian rocks, so anytime that you're out on a hike and you look at a lava and you see these little green minerals, that is the mineral olivine. Now, olivine is one of the most common minerals on our planet. In fact, we think that most of the interior of the Earth is made of this mineral. But it's also very common in uh, Hawaiian lavas, and uh, using olivine, I can learn a lot about the magma history, where it moved, how it was stored, and what happened to this magma before it erupted at the surface. Another cool thing I like about olivine is that uh, if anybody has a birthday in August, the birthstone for August is called peridot. Peridot is the gem quality variety of the mineral olivine. So all you August birthdays out there, this is your mineral. Olivine is a relatively simple mineral. It's primarily composed of iron and magnesium atoms. And we can measure these compositions in the minerals using a variety of different uh, techniques. Uh, so part of my job is to be out in the field uh, collecting samples, but uh, perhaps a bigger part of my job is to be in the lab. We can look at these minerals using a scanning electron microscope, and that actually tells us a lot. We can infer how hot the magma was, so we can get temperature with this iron and magnesium measurement. And changes in these iron and magnesium contents also tell us a lot about time. So we can actually look at changes in the chemistry to think about how long the magmas were sitting inside the volcano. When we measure the composition of olivine, we are often working with our partners at the University of Hawaii in Hilo. Uh, they have a scanning electron microscope and we can take our samples and use that instrument to map all the different elements that are present. Most of the time we try to study phenocrysts, which is just a a uh, geologic term for a crystal that's typically greater than a half a millimeter in size. And these phenocrysts, which are kind of larger uh, minerals, uh, those are primarily only olivine. So after we go out into the field and we collect a sample, we usually bring back a bag that's sort of a mixture of fragments of older rocks, uh, some fresh lava, or we call it juvenile material, and then in this bag are also olivine crystals. Using the microscope, we can search through this, this mixture of material and pick out the olivine crystals that we can then study. And ultimately, after we pick our crystals, we will polish them and mount them so that we can put them in instruments. And this is uh, one example of, of a, an olivine mount. These are Kianakakoi olivine, and they're mounted in a metal disc that's then been coated with gold. And so each one of these little shiny uh, surfaces that you see, that's, uh, each one is an individual olivine crystal. And we've cut them in half and prepared them uh, for the instrument. One of the techniques that I'm really excited to apply in Hawaiian volcanoes research is called diffusion, uh, diffusion chronometry. Each individual crystal is like a little stopwatch. It's a time capsule of information, and if we know how to read the chemistry correctly, we can get at how long the magmas were inside the volcano before they erupted. This map is one example of what a Kilauea olivine looks like when you measure it with an electron microprobe. We're looking at the distribution of iron in this olivine crystal, and you can see based on the color changes that there's more iron in parts of the crystal compared to others, and there's kind of a gradient between them. In this case, I would make a measurement between the core of this crystal and its rim and use that information to think about the time scales of this magma storage process. These olivine crystals from Kilauea's December 2020 eruption have forced right zoning, shown as dark gray cores with light gray rims in these scanning electron microscope images. Most December 2020 olivine crystals have modeled diffusion times of about 60 days or less. And this suggests that the crystals, which originally grew deeper inside the volcano, moved up to a few kilometers or less than two miles below the ground surface about 60 days before they erupted. At that time, in late October of 2020, HBO detected the first set of earthquake swarms during the period of unrest leading to the eruption. These olivine crystals show that the earthquakes were due to magma intruding shallowly underneath Kilauea's summit. 
There are also some zoned olivine crystals from the September 2021 eruption that are being modeled right now to calculate the time scales from these most recent crystal clocks. Using diffusion in olivine is actually a really important tool for us because it helps us to understand eruptions that occurred prior to any scientific monitoring. So we know that Kilauea is a very dynamic volcano with lots of effusive eruptions that characterize sort of our historical past. But before that, Kilauea was actually quite an explosive volcano during the period that we call the Kanakakoi Tephra. Most of these eruptions, especially the Kanakakoi Tephra and other prehistoric explosive periods, they occurred prior to the arrival of Western visitors to the Hawaiian Islands, and not many are recorded in Native Hawaiian oral tradition. And so we have very little scientific monitoring data, and we have very little observational data that tells us what these eruptions were like. We're hoping that we can use the mineral chemistry to fill in the gaps of this knowledge so that we can have a better understanding of what was going on at the volcano during these times. As an example, what olivine is telling us about Kanakakoi is that the plumbing system, the magma reservoirs beneath the surface, was actually very different at Kilauea during this explosive time compared to the modern effusive period. From the timescales modeling, we know that magmas during Kanakakoi were coming in from deep into the shallow parts of the system and mixing with other stored magmas. Now these mixing events were occurring anywhere from a few weeks to a few months prior to each eruption. And so using this information, we're getting a better understanding of how the volcano evolved over this 300 year period of mostly explosive eruptions. We wanna keep looking at these prehistoric eruptions to learn as much as we can about them. We also want to apply diffusion chronometry on Mauna Loa eruptions, and we can also use these techniques uh, on Hualalai and other volcanoes in Hawaii. Overall, we hope to get a better understanding of how these volcanoes evolved long term over hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Having a better understanding of how Hawaiian volcanoes have evolved over centuries and thousands of years gives us a better idea of what future hazards might be if the volcanoes start to erupt in this different explosive style.